Good morning, party people. How's it going? Good to see Surly Dev. Good to see you uh, this morning, too, as well. Uh, Amir's in. Jedi Mind Gorilla. Oh, you're not going uh, boating this morning, huh? Or maybe uh, later. <laughs> Enjoy it for Brent Sickburns. That's funny. Um, so, oh, okay, cool. We've got uh, already folks uh, asking in questions, so that's fantastic. Today I'll do an open q and I was trying to decide between uh, doing TempDB demos versus an open Q&A, and I think I'm going to hold the TempDB demos because I have a class coming up on, uh, oh, raining. Ouch. Yeah, that would totally do it. Uh, Denmark. Oh, I love, uh, love Denmark. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, yeah, doing an open Q&A because I've got my Fundamentals of TempDB class coming up on December the 7th, I think. I mean, like, it's coming up in a week now. So I was like, ah, I probably shouldn't do those demos publicly. I should probably save those for the class. I have a whole bunch of brand new demos uh, coming up inside there. So, so yeah, the way that uh, the Q&As work is ask your questions. Just only ask them once. Please just only post those questions once. They'll go into a queue, and then we'll go through first come, first serve. Damn, you added a 55-inch TV to your workshop. So true story. So uh, Jedi Mind Gorilla, I'm, we're in the midst of trying to figure out whether or not we buy a house over in Iceland, like when we go over and move over. And I don't understand why. It seems like everybody in Iceland only has one car garages. We're like looking at houses and the vast majority have one car garages. I have this terrible sinking feeling that we're going to get over there and the taxes on cars are going to be utterly insane relative to what we're used to in the States. Uh, so I'm curious to see how this goes because I want to do, I've always wanted to have my uh, my office actually in the garage so that when I do the same, yeah, I don't understand why though. That's the, that's the thing that I, I mean, most of Europe I kind of get, but uh, then so I've always wanted to have the side camera so that in the garage you would see cars, you know, that I would have kind of my workshop going, but we'll see how that actually goes. Um, uh, uh, who's that? Dirigible Diplomo. I like the dirigible thing. Says more than one car is not that common outside the States. Yeah, I, I mean, it depends on the country. It's extremely common still in Mexico and in Canada. So I'm not sure, uh, like, I'm curious to see what it goes into. It's like, why isn't it that common? So we'll have to go through and see. All right, so let's see. I'm going to start adding uh, some of the questions. Just the Twitch ones. Uh, I'm going to add the Twitch ones, uh, Surly Dev, so that if you go through and add, ha, 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 Richie says, is anyone else watching this from a roller hockey rink? What are you doing in a roller hockey rink? That's bananas. Uh, it's Coder's Life. How many cars do you have? Right now, I only have two. Uh, I have my primary car is a Porsche 911 Targa, and then I also have a Jeep uh, Wrangler up at my dad's house in Michigan. Um, so it's, uh, he's working. That's, it's funny. It's probably true. Uh, but there are like a list of cars. I would probably be happy with three, but right now we're only, uh, we're, because we live in downtown San Diego, our building only has one parking spot per apartment. And so I just can't get more in, but it's one of those where the instant that we can have uh, multiple garages again, I'm all over it. I think my high at four so far is the most I've ever had, but I'm looking forward to get up back up in like the three to four car range. There's so many cars that I would just absolutely love to own. Not expensive ones. You know, I like cheap cars for the most part. The Porsche is different, but you know, so, so on and so forth. I am an angry gumball. Good to see you again. Says SP Blitz makes fun of me for using maintenance plans. What is the preferred alternative? Ola Hollingren scripts run through the agent. Correct. Ola Hollingren scripts give you way more flexibility. And I am super happy to report uh, that after a long hiatus, he is back. Uh, Ola Hollingren has started releasing uh, changes to his scripts again. So I'm absolutely uh, tickled pink with that. I was worried about, oh, he's been gone for several months just doing his own thing. And so now he's back and he's released like five or six updates to his maintenance scripts in the last 30 days. So all kinds of fantastic capabilities there. Um, there are bugs to look out for just as there are kind of issues inside a maintenance plan. So make sure you read the documentation for Ola scripts. Next up, over on YouTube, thanks, Surly Dev. <laughs> uh, over on YouTube, Orbit asks, I have some large indexes, 300 million rows, uh, views, having joins. I can see that they're slowing down inserts or updates. I have the optimal number of indexes and columns in them. Any ideas? 
I don't know what optimal number of indexes and columns is. So this, this is where I'd turn it around and ask on you, if you have the optimal number, then either you're okay with how much they're slowing down inserts, updates, and deletes, or if you're not happy with that, then you don't have the optimal number. Because every time that you make another copy of the data, every time you add additional non-clustered indexes, they will slow down, inserts, updates, and deletes. So it's a balancing point based on your hardware and how slow you're willing to tolerate their inserts, updates, and deletes going. If you're not happy with the slowness of inserts, updates, and deletes, then you don't have the optimal number of indexes. You're going to have to back those down or invest in faster hardware. That also works as well. Next up. Over on YouTube, Mike L. asks, is there a legit point in time where I'm allowed to say the query rollback takes too long and it doesn't seem to go anywhere, let's restart the service? So the thing is, if there's a rollback happening and you restart the SQL Server service, SQL Server just opens up the transaction log and says, all right, what was I doing? Oh, I was rolling back a query. I shall continue, and he'll continue to do the rollback. So it's not like you're stopping the rollback when you restart the SQL Server service. Oh, doesn't that suck? It says, is there anything else to check besides kill with status only? Unfortunately, no. That's the only the real like detailed thing we get for rollbacks. What I would say is if you're having this problem a lot, if you're having this problem a lot where you have to kill uh, rollbacks or you know, monitor the status of rollbacks, Check out SQL Server 2019's new feature, Accelerated Database Recovery. Accelerate da Accelerated Database Recovery keeps copies of rows inside the user database, basically moves the version store from TempDB over inside of the user database, so that if you need to kill a query, SQL Server simply switches over to the versions that are already pre present inside the user database. So then at that point, the rollbacks are nearly instantaneous makes a pretty big difference. The, the drawback of that is that it does require additional space inside the user databases. Uh, and also it's a very buggy feature in terms of is brand new in SQL Server 2019. And they've already had one corruption bug with it. I, I'm, I would expect it because it's a dramatic, huge change in the way that SQL Server stores and delivers data. I, it's normal to expect that they'll find bugs. Uh, but it looks like that that has the, pr the promise to reduce your pains in the future. Next up over on uh, YouTube, VTech Fred says, I like that, VTech Fred just kicked in, yo. I inherited a server with 189 triggers. Well, that's the opposite of VTech. How do you approach troubleshooting a stored procedure with nine triggers involved? To me, it's really no different whether the code is in the trigger or in the stored procedure. It really makes no difference to me whatsoever. You can kind of think of it as the code that's inside the triggers has just been inserted into the proc. So the way that I like to troubleshoot is that I, and this is going to sound kind of extreme, but if I'm on a dev server, I'm going to free the plan cache. I'm going to go run the code and then I'm going to run SP blitz cache. SP blitz cache will show you the most resource intensive queries inside the plan cache. There are times when that doesn't work, like if people have option recompile turned on, and I go into solutions for that inside my mastering query tuning classes. But really this way you can see by sorting SP Blitz cache's output, you can sort by duration, by reads, by writes, by CPU, whatever sort order you're interested in. And then because you freed the plan cache, ran your code, and then ran SP Blitz cache, you see everything that was in the plan cache, regardless of its source, like triggers, stored procedures, and so forth. Obviously, teaching you how to use SP Blitz cache is beyond the scope of what I can do here, but hopefully that gets you started on that journey. Next up, uh, Steve says, I have found deleting maintenance plans completely blows up your MSDB size. I don't know what you're talking about. It sounds like you have the interesting start to a question. I, I, that has not been my experience. I can add and drop maintenance plans and it doesn't have anything to do with MSDB size. There may, you might be at the heart of something interesting though. If you have a reproduction script, like do this, do this, then do this, and MSDB explodes, go post it over on dba.stackexchange.com and then other people will try to reproduce it. 
Next up over on YouTube, Ringarajan says, Hi, good morning. Good morning to you as well. In SQL Server, my TempDB collation is one, and my production database collation is a different. Will this cause any performance issue? I don't know if it'll cause performance issues, but it'll cause code issues, like your code will completely break. Oh, Steve says, sorry, it was a follow-up to a previous question. Oh, okay, uh, sorry. I, I, don't, uh, I don't agree with you. It's interesting, but I, I don't, that has not been my experience, sir. Uh, so uh, about the TempDB, or about the uh, TempDB collation, there, it's not as much of a performance issue for me as it is a code breaking issue, where if you dump stuff into TempDB, then you try to join it to a user database with a different collation, you can run into join errors. Uh, so if, when that's, that's the thing that I would worry about there, and that's why you generally want the system databases to always match the user database collations, or else you get into those kinds of breaking problems. Next up, Rahanalis. Boy, that, that's just beautiful. That's just like poetic. I would like to hear that out loud. Rahanalis sounds like a science fiction movie. That, I'm, I would watch that movie. Uh, do you recommend to have different file groups for indexes and data? No. Uh, think about what's the problem you're trying to solve. Like, what do you expect to be different when you have different file groups? This was good advice 15, 20 years ago. And I'll tell you how things went 15, 20 years ago. This is going to sound almost too strange to believe, but we used to store data on these Frisbees that were made of metal, and they would spin at very high speeds. It's kind of like a record player, but that goes even back further into medieval history, and you won't understand what that reference means. But they were these big spinning rotational platters, and if you moved the physical arm around to read from one section of the frisbee to the next, it was actually a mechanical motion. They had little leprechauns inside these drives that would move the arms around. So random access, jumping around from one place to another, sucked. So back then, back in the 15, 20 years ago Dark Ages, it made sense to separate, people thought, people thought it made sense to separate them out so different leprechauns could be reading from different uh, things at the same time. Well, that, that was a, the standard edition. Enterprise edition was the leprechauns. And of course, I always work with enterprise edition because that's how I roll. Um, that people thought that if you separated them onto different spindles or so that different leprechauns could be doing their work, that then you'd be able to read from one data file group and then write to another file group. In practice, you just never have one thing going at a time, so it, it didn't really work. Next up, Santa! Santa! Welcome, Santa! Good to see you! Cheers! Hope things are going well at the North Pole. I should go through my list of things. Santa, this year, what I would really like is a Jaguar XKRS convertible, but it has to be French racing blue, just only French racing blue. There's a, Santa, you don't even have to pay for it. If you can point me to one that's on sale, French racing blue, Jaguar XKRS convertible, I will be forever in your favor. I'm going to be better next year. I promise I'll hardly suck at all. It says, how would you manage enabling jobs on an AG secondary in case of a failure? Now, I'm going to give you my answer. It may not be the answer that you're looking for, but I'm going to give you my answer. The first step of every job is going to be a piece of T-SQL that determines whether or not this job should run on this replica. Like, am I the pr uh, pr uh, primary replica or not? In the event that, for example, I'm taking log backups on the primary, the first step is going to be, hey, am I the primary replica? If so, he's going to continue on with the job. If not, he's going to gracefully fail. And then I'm going to leave every job running on every replica all the time. Because when all hell breaks loose and you fail over from one place to another, you don't want to guess whether or not like a job is supposed to be running or not. Every job should just be running every time. That's my answer. I know it's not the answer that you're looking for, but that's the way that I roll with my availability groups. Next up, Bess says, good to see you again. How will backup transaction logs affect a peer-to-peer -peer transactional replication? None at all. SQL Server will automatically track whether or not the log can be cleared out. Like if it needs to still keep the log file open to replicate data to another SQL Server, SQL Server manages that for you. Now the downside of that is if one of your peers disappears or if it can't disappears, <laughs> that's actually, that's pretty good, disappearing peers. Um, 
the, then it gets further behind the, the log file can grow and grow so that's why often people will have as part of their checklist if a replica goes down and replication stops working there will come a point where people will say let's break the glass and just go ahead and remove that replica so that we don't have to worry about keeping this big giant transaction log Next up, uh, oh, Control K, Control C says, can you describe the best and most creative usage of SQL Server you've seen amongst your clients? No, because uh, so many uh, clients have me sign NDAs, and I'm not going to be able to remember offhand which ones signed NDAs, uh, especially when you talk about people who have best and creative uses of SQL Server. They will also be really high up on making sure that I sign an NDA because they're proud of what they do, and they don't want anyone else to figure it out. It's a wonderful question, and I really love it, and I've seen so much cool stuff with SQL server I get really excited about that kind of thing but and another way that I think about it too is I it's gonna sound really stupid but when I walk up to a window and I see skyscrapers I love to think about all the places where people are using SQL Server. Like I'll point at a building and I'll go, I'll bet there's SQL Server inside there and I would love to know what they're doing with it. I always find that just amazing. Um, I'll tell you one because I can keep it generic enough. Uh, one that I absolutely loved was SQL servers inside of vending machines. Now, these weren't vending machines that were delivering uh, soda pop and candy bars, but very high-end vending machines. Think you swipe a card and there goes thousands of dollars. Um, so I've seen them used in high-end vending machines in order to track inventory and help uh, folks from remote figure out what items needed to be uh, uh, so, uh, in reordered next in what order. Oh, that was just so much fun. Gold, there was Bitcoin vending machines too. I was not involved with either of those, but those those I found really interesting. I remember when Bitcoin started going wild, there was a vending machine, essentially an ATM at my neighborhood gas station. I didn't leave and live in a great neighborhood either. And I was like, well, who is using a Bitcoin vending machine? That is just absolutely insane. Uh, Shramik says, can you guide us on how to troubleshoot SSIS packages? Not at all. I don't do SSIS at all. The person that I would check with is Andy Leonard on Twitch. If you go to twitch.tv slash Andy Leonard. Uh, Andy has a Twitch channel where he does cover SSIS, Azure Data Factory, Bimmel, and he uh, uh, does consulting and training classes too as well. So you can go attend his training classes and learn how to do that kind of thing. There you go. Yeah, Surly Dev nails it. Right there is the URL right there. Welcome to the club, Jay. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, Eriker from Iceland. Good to see you. How would you compare performance differences on SQL servers using different versions in hardware without doing a full analysis? That's a great question. So for me, what I love to do when I'm doing that is I take just one query at a time. I have the, the customer say, give me 10 queries that you care passionately about that are currently causing you problems and give me the 10 queries that you run the most often. Both of those, we can use SP Blitz Cache to go determine those. So what I like about doing it one query at a time is that I can take, take that exact query, free the plan cache, run it on one, run it on the other, and then compare the shape of the execution plans. Usually that's the first place we just have to start tuning because all of a sudden we see differently shaped execution plans. So the key for me, rather than doing an entire workload analysis, take 10 queries that you're struggling with, 10 fast queries that you're not struggling with, and we usually find differences that surprise people on both sides. Like they have a query that's currently going insanely fast, uh, then later, that, or as we switch over to the new version, all of a sudden it gets a different shape plan, and people are like, whoa, that would actually cause us problems. And that's when you start playing around with uh, compatibility levels. Next up, Fernando over on YouTube says, is the primary key a clustered index in the same? Da, 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 da. Is the same a primary key that created, if I have both, this will create an issue on the same. I'm not exactly sure what you're asking. Um, I'm not exactly. I think what you might be asking is, is it okay to have a clustered index that's on different columns than the primary key? 
it's okay. It's just really unusual. I'm going to guess that out of 100 uh, primary keys out in the field, probably 95 to 99 of them are the clustered index. So it's just fairly unusual to see that. What I would ask is, what's the problem you're trying to solve by changing those, by having a different primary key from clustered index? I talk about when you would do that in my mastering index tuning class, but it's, it's pretty rare. Next up, CT says, in SQL Server 2017, we're experiencing log file corruption on the AG secondary. Is there a way to fix it without rebuilding? So whenever you hear corruption, you know how you watch those haunted house movies or horror movies, and the lead character says, do you hear that screaming? It's coming from the house over there. We better go look. And you're like, no, you're an idiot. Get out of there. No, run. You should go the other way. Or like, do you hear those chainsaws? I bet that's where we can get some friendly help is the noise of the chainsaws. No, get out of there. When you're having corruption, forget trying to fix it. That's like in the horror movie when they're like, maybe we can help them. No, run, pave that server, walk away from it, erase it. Because the problem isn't the corruption. The problem is the hardware or the operating system. And if it gets corrupted once, it's just going to keep getting corrupted again. So get out of the haunted house. Uh, Santa says, uh, hopefully they aren't using SQL Server 2000 in those skyscrapers. So, spoiler alert, they're, they're usually using SQL Server 2000. It's, uh, I should ask for like a show of hand over in chat, or, like how many of y'all are still supporting SQL Server 2000 or 2005, which are long out of support. I know a lot of people still have 2008, which is also technically out of support and under most circumstances. But uh, yeah, it's, it's insane how many. Mm. That, yes, it will. Yep. Yeah, it will. So next up, uh, and so truncate is the wrong word. It doesn't truncate. It just marks it as available for reuse. Next up, Jedi Mind Gorilla says, I just did the last SQL Server 2000 we had last week, hopefully getting uh, rid of every server. It's so amazing how it's like this just continuous hamster wheel of technology. Operating systems is the exact same thing. We're just continuously uh, running on this uh, wheel to try and keep up with versions. That's what the big reason why I was so excited about the cloud. You know, you think like Azure SQL DB, Azure SQL DB managed instances, that they're just going to automatically pass for you. There's a value to that. That's that's kind of nice. I don't really want to be on the hamster wheel there. Uh, over on YouTube, Stephen Roberts says, Hey Brent from a rainy United Kingdom. In reporting services, is it possible to set a data source to use group managed service accounts to run a report for the permission? I have no idea. I actually don't do anything with reporting services. I'm going to guess that that's a no, just based on what I've used, or read about managed service accounts. Uh, but I would go ahead and post that on Stack Exchange, like dba.stackexchange.com. Somebody's likely to know over there, but I'm kind of expecting the answer to be no. Uh, <laughs> Jedi Mongrel says, will you still be able to get salmon and leak? It's salmon and lox, or uh, lox is salmon. Salmon is lox, lox is salmon. It's... Lox is like cured salmon uh, with coffee in Iceland, or did the coffee and bagel move pl place move there? I am one of those people who I can be happy pretty much anywhere, and I try to eat whatever food is local. So as a as a funny thing, I'm actually being involved when I work uh, go over there. I'm actually going to be involved in the fishing industry, which is kind of neat. I'm not getting on a. I will get on a boat if I get the chance, but that's not what my job is. Uh, so I'm very excited for the prospect of even more fresh fish. I actually don't expect the bagel to be bagels to be uh, great, but I have really low standards for bagels. I could probably eat and put a hockey puck in front of me as long as it's you know an everything hockey puck. I would probably be okay with that. Uh, Eriker says from Iceland, question number two, you brought up an interesting thought on collation. On a SaaS system serving multiple regions where the regions uses different collation, what would be the system? Generally on a SaaS, they standardize on one collation and they don't jump between collations in the same database just because it would cause so many other problems. Um, there, there is the possibility if you design one database per client, it's just extremely rare. Like I don't think I've ever come across it. So. 
I mean, I, I've come across, to be clear, I've come across a lot of software as a service clients who do a different database per client. It's just rare that I've never seen someone use a different collation per client. Uh, next up, Technix Optics says, I would like to research triggers on MySQL. I actually don't uh, do any teaching about MySQL. This stream is about Microsoft SQL Server, so they're totally different products. Even though a query syntax is very similar, I don't actually do, like, do any kind of detailed administration of MySQL. I, I actually do use it. Like if you go to brenozar.com, that entire site is hosted in MySQL. Uh, but I, I don't I like teach on it or anything like that. I don't even run queries on there except like once a month. Sean says, when getting started with maintenance on a new server, is there something you recommend to start with? I'm new to this stuff. Yes, that's why we have our Fundamentals of Database Administration class. If you go to brentozar.com, so if you go to brentozar.com, oops, my keyboard died off there, brentozar.com, and you click on Training up top, I have a Fundamentals of Database Administration class, and the description pretty well tells it all there. I'll give you a second to read that while I have a sip of my tasty beverage. So there you go. Uh, and so you can go get that over at brentozar.com uh, and just click uh, training over at the top. And they've got all kinds of videos about uh, how to go get started doing things like maintenance, backup, recovery, corruption, all kinds of stuff like that. <laughs> Next up, oh, Erica says, I'll put you in touch with a friend of mine that has a fishing boat in Iceland. I would actually love that. Uh, I'm super excited about that kind of thing. Now, I probably wouldn't do it right away until we get vaccinated. We're still kind of on the whole, uh, we're going to isolate as much as we possibly can when we get there, just because I don't want to be the American who brings over the coronavirus and then uh, things uh, uh, get kind of worse. <laughs> so yesterday was the first day I popped open my Advent my whiskey advent calendar. So Flaviar had these whiskey advent calendars this year where they ship you a big box of whiskey, um, 24 different whiskeys from all over the world. And so you get this big box with a different little slot for each day. So here's day two, because I just finished off day one. So here's day two, and let me go get this out, just because it's kind of cute to see. Every day you get a different uh, whiskey, uh, and then they give you these little postcards that explain the whiskeys. Oh my God, the first day was fantastic. It was so good. I was like, man, this, I totally love this. Uh, so that was kind of fun to have. Not drinking another one of those this morning. I'm going to hold that off for later in the day. Uh, so, so fucking dumb says, have you ever had a problem you couldn't solve for a client? And what did you do? Yes. Oh, yeah, sure. Absolutely. Now, in a perfect world, when I'm working with the client during the sales process, I'll say, hey, you know what? This doesn't seem like a good fit for me. I'll give you a great example. Somebody contacted me recently for help with service broker. I don't do service broker. I never have. Like I did play with it once with it ran through a script with Adam Mechanic and that was like the end of it for me. Uh, so as soon as they said, hey, we our major pain point is fixing this thing with service broker, I'm like, I'm out of here. Go call SQL skills, you know. Uh, but I'll try and redirect people to the right uh, avenue for help. Um, there are also p uh, problems I didn't want to fix, too, as well, where I'm like, oh, I see what the problem is here. You're trying to scale on, you know, using an Etch-a-Sketch, and it's not really my thing. Uh, I'd like to introduce you to other consultants. Um, but if when I hit a problem that uh, that the clients already signed for things and we're working together and I'm like, oh, man, I just can't figure this out. I go straight up to the client. Look, here's the deal. I can't I don't understand what this is. I can't figure it out. I don't want your money. You know, I'm going to give you a refund off of the deposit uh, so that I don't want you paying for anything if I couldn't address whatever it was that your problem was. And it's really funny that a lot of times clients will be like, you know what, that's OK. Just knowing that it was beyond you is uh, worth it for us in terms of the money. Oh, for example, once I had a, a client with a two node always on availability group, a particular task ran really fast on one node and was really slow on another node. And it wasn't statistics, it wasn't parameter sniffing, it wasn't differences in the hardware. 
And so I, I would even run like crystal disk mark checks against the two replicas and they return different results and they're supposed to be identical hardware. And I'm like, you know what? This hardware isn't really identical. I know you think it is, but something's busted inside one of these replicas. If I was you, I would pave it, you know, do diagnostics on it and start over. Um, but I can't prove that. You know, I can't prove that there's something different about these replicas. It's just that the two, even like disk tests, don't match. Um, and that client was like, okay, thanks. You know, it was totally worth it. Uh, we appreciate it. We're giving up, gonna pay you anyway. And sure enough, they paved it and they found one of the drives was broken. So it's kind of cool. Uh, but I think that there's a luxury of being able to say, I don't want your money. Like I'm lucky in that I'm, I'm at the point in the career in my business where I have a long line of work that I can do. And I don't want a dissatisfied customer ever. If you're not happy, I don't want you paying anything. You know, I would much rather go steer you towards someone that you'll be happy with. So world's too small. You don't want a bad reputation for that kind of thing. <laughs> Ooh, neat. Uh, CW Train says one SQL server I work on watches turbines in a coal-fired power plant. All sorts of interesting places for it to turn up. Oh, yeah, I love the thought of a SQL server being involved in nuclear reactors. You know, it's always the kind of thing I love. Uh, Camilla says, what happens when a table doesn't have any kind of key? It's called a heap, H-E-A-P, a heap. And the data is just effectively stored in random order. It's just shuffled across uh, 8K pages. And when SQL Server needs to go find a row, it can be very slow to find a specific row. It's actually okay in some scenarios where you don't care how the data is stored, where all you're doing is logging it to disk. And then whenever you read it, you expect to read the whole entire thing. So this was a design pattern for data warehouses a long time ago where people just wanted to shove the data in as quickly as they could. And then they expected every report query to scan the whole entire table. It's not the best design these days, but it was uh, a decade ago or so. <laughs> Jedi Mind Gorilla says uh, we, we blew up our last SQL Server 2000 with Tannerite. I don't know if you've seen email a dumpster fire, but if you Google for email a dumpster fire, you can email something and it gets printed out and put into a dumpster fire, which is kind of funny. Uh, VJ Red says, a question in corruption, does a SQL agent job fail if there is corruption? Well, I see part of the problem there. You're trying to type SQL agent and you got SQL QGIN. I think the problem's maybe in your keyboard or a really bad network connection. Uh, so can it fail? Sure, but not necessarily. You can also have corruption that doesn't cause failures. That where the data is still garbage, but uh, you just don't get a warning back. Great examples are logical corruption inside indexed views, where they'll even pass a check DB unless you run check DB with extended logical checks. It's just that you're selecting data out and you're getting incorrect data back. Uh, all right, so let's give a, a quick shout out to Surly Dev, our moderator in here, who is uh, faithfully copying and pasting your questions from YouTube over into Twitch and putting them in a nice queue, uh, making it possible for me to do these questions without uh, pulling my own hair out. What little of it there's left. There's actually way too much hair left. I need a haircut. That's on today's agenda. That's going to be the first thing that I go do. My wife was like, uh, hey, you know, she's, she's like, I notice that you're wearing hats a lot this week, you need to go uh, go get your hair cut. And I'm like, you are correct. So next up, Richard asks, uh, regarding Surly the best. <laughs> that's, that's pretty good. That's pretty good. Now, Richard says, SSIS is quite chatty when things go wrong. Check the executions report. Um, and again, logging too, absolutely. I, I would just go, because it's such a big question, I would go over to Andy's channel and go discuss it over there too as well. Ha ha ha. Mr. Early says, I'll let you moderate your own questions to save you the cost of a haircut. I am, I'm kind of, it's kind of weird. I'm blessed with a full set of hair. I have hair from my mom's side of the family where they go gray really early, but they have full sets, full heads of hair. I don't mind the gray at all because like I've always been totally immature and uh, kind of a goofball. Um, then, so I'm kind of like, eh, you know, some look of maturity uh, kind of helps a little bit. Oh, um, an interestingly named person, Kankatar, says, how much money can I earn as a SQL worker? For that, I'll show you where to go. 
go over to brentozar.com slash go slash salary. brentozar.com slash go slash salary. And from there, you can read my annual salary survey. Once a year, we do a salary survey where people can put in how much they earn, where they live, what their job description is. I want to say that last year, the... <laughs> I want to say the high end was around like two hundred fifty to three hundred fifty thousand dollars a year U.S. Keep in mind that those are typically consultants or contractors who work in uh, like niche industries or locations. Like people who live in London traditionally make much more than people who live in other areas of the U.K. Um, yeah, so it's it's uh, it goes all the way up to you can make in hundreds of thousands, even uh, over a million dollars a year if you specialize very deeply and you have a good network of consultant or of uh, customers. It's more typical to make between a hundred and a hundred and fifty thousand dollars U.S. per year. Is a better, more mainstream kind of area. Next up, let's see here. Richard says from over on YouTube, uh, what are the gotchas of RCSI? So if you go to brentozar.com slash go slash RCSI, Kendra Little has a really nice write-up where she talks about how you can get different query results than you got before. It can introduce uh, race conditions inside your code. We're not gonna we're not gonna do any more questions about that. You've asked several here. Please don't ask any further ones around peer-to-peer -peer transactional replication and log backups. Thanks for understanding. For further questions, go hit the documentation or hit Stack Exchange. Um, so the, the first one is that your query can get different results. The next one is that the version store uh, in TempDB can grow when people do a begin tran and then they don't commit. Um, the version store can grow when any database with RCSI has an open transaction. It affects all databases with RCSI, so it's particularly problematic on servers that have a lot of databases on them and any database holds a transaction open. Um, also causes more writes and reads on TempDB, so if your temp DB was teetering on the edge of collapse before, like if you were running it on a pair of decrepit spinning rusty frisbees, then that would also cause a problem too as well. Uh, next thing here we have, uh, Widub says from over on YouTube, how do I find what query caused async network IO? We occasionally have 10 seconds of this wait type. If it's only 10 seconds every now and then, there's a famous database administrator who has a song about that, and she said, let it go. Uh, I don't know if that's how it goes. I've just kind of only seen clips of it. Uh, but ten, occasional 10 seconds, who cares? Life goes on. It's not like it's holding up your SQL server at all. Let it go. Uh, next up, control K, control C. <laughs> uh, so I shouldn't be laughing about this, but I feel pain when clients report the target principal name is incorrect, uh, cannot generate SSPI context. Um, I've read too many blogs. Uh, some cases, none of the ish suggestions resolved it. I'll show you where I go. <laughs> So I don't have to troubleshoot this very often, but when I do have to do it, pinboard.in, this is where I keep my bookmarks. So if you hit pinboard.in slash u colon Brento, so I'll leave that up for a second so that you can type it out. Uh, you get, this is my live bookmarks, so you can go see them live as I'm typing stuff in every time that I do a bookmark, so you can see here's how to play ambient sounds on your home pod. Got bookmarked that yesterday. Brilliant post by Steph the Pef uh, Schrader about the Cadillac Cimarron was not a bad cat or was a bad caddy, but not as awful as you think. Um, you can also search if you go over here to search, you can put in SSPI. And there are a few bookmarks here that they're not uh, young by any means, but the information on them hasn't changed. These are the places where I would go. And in every case, these have been able to solve the problems that I've been up against. So hopefully that helps. A quick shout out to this week's sponsor. This week's sponsor is my annual Black Friday sale. So if you go over to brentosr.com slash Black Friday, the sale ends Monday, as in Monday will be the last day that you can buy the stuff. 
Uh, so if you need to get permission from your manager or whatever on Monday, you can totally do that. That is brentozar.com slash Black Friday. And that's where I have my live class season pass, my class recordings, the master's recordings, SQL Constant Care, the consultant toolkit, all that stuff that you've been seeing me talk about for the last couple of years and you've wished you've been able to get into, this is the one time of year when I really discount the bejesus out of that. So that is brentozar.com slash Black Friday. <laughs> Next up, let's see, uh, Eriker says from over in Iceland, um, have you ever come across corruption recovery software that works? I have no, I've, I've come across them that demo really well, that they fix one particular kind of corruption, uh, but that, yeah, exactly. I got two, at least two more years. I'm gonna, aiming for 50 is what I'm aiming for, so I got a little over two years. Um, so I've not come across good corruption recovery software. Um, I've seen a lot of um, software where, uh, so that here's, a, here's how it works as a blogger. S companies that want to get free marketing for their stuff will give you a free license if you post a blog post about it. So what bloggers will do is they'll be like, sure, I'll post it. Yeah, you're going to give me like $200? Okay. So they review the software, but all they do is follow a checklist from the vendor. And if you follow specific steps, then it looks like the software works. But then if you used it in a real world capacity, it falls apart spectacularly. So I have not seen stuff that I would have put my name anywhere near. I've seen a lot of crappy stuff out there. Marco from over on YouTube says, what's your opinion about Microsoft certs? Is it worth to have these certs right now? Um, I have a blog post coming up in December where I talk about this, but I'm going to give you the short answer is, if you're in a stack of resumes, if, you, if you're competing against 50 other people, one of the most common things that HR professionals will do is they'll just look for anything that will help them cull people out of that stack. And what they often use is certifications, even though the certs are garbage. So if you're in a pile of resumes and you need to get through to the HR person, then the certificates can help. But otherwise, they're really hot garbage because they don't measure what database administrators really do or developers or anything like that. I've known brilliant people who haven't been able to pass Microsoft certification tests. And I've also met people who passed the certification tests that couldn't find their butts with both hands, you know, just had no idea what they were doing. Ah, it's early dev says, I think administering a 2000 database is still on my CV. I still say that I'm a Microsoft certified master and that was a decade ago. Like they killed that product, I don't know, eight or nine years ago. And I'm like, I keep meaning to say, I got to stop using that term when I'm introducing myself because it's just, it's irrelevant now. Uh, Richard says, what's your opinion about certification? Same, same thing here. Well, uh, employees certificate or stipulated as a requirement. Yeah, it's because if you ever go to, through the process of hiring people, if you put a job out there and you say we're hiring a database administrator or a database developer or anything similar to that, you're going to get a gajillion resumes from people who have no idea how the product works because of course they hear on a stream people like me saying that people couldn't make 100 to 150,000 a year with SQL Server they're like hey that sounds a whole lot better than the stuff that I'm doing um, so that people will just throw their resumes in when they have no idea what they're doing that's exactly why folks use it as a filter uh, Zagugli Bob says, any chance that we can buy your Black Friday bundle from the EU, please? No, unfortunately, because of that pesky GDPR uh, regulation. I am working towards that. I think that I'm going to be able to do it at some point in 2021. Um, it's part of when I when I switch over to Iceland, um, I'm basically trying to not take on any new consulting clients at all during 2021. I'll work with my existing clients, but I'm trying not to take on any new ones. And one of the things that I'm doing as part of that process is uh, working towards moving the shop over to the EU to like a reseller to Gumroad or Shopify or something like that so that people could buy it. The prices would still be the same, but it's just that then it would be eligible for the EU folks. We would tack on uh, taxes, of course. 
Next up, Elton John asks, you probably get that all the time. That's not fair. I love the name Elton. It's really cool. Would it be considered a bad practice installing reporting services on the same VM? Um, the licensing guide says if I install it elsewhere, then I have to pay for it. Well, it's a great question. It depends on how much performance you need. If you need a ton of performance, then it's, all, it's very common for people to separate things out because they want to give each piece as much CPU and as much memory as it can possibly get. If you don't need high performance, then you can run them all on the same clown car and it doesn't really hurt you that much. So the, the first thing that I would just ask is, are people complaining about performance today? If they're already complaining about performance, don't put any more clowns in that car. Tell the other clowns to go get their own car core. Uh, CTI Geek says, whoa, what's that dome-like thing outside your window? That is the San Diego Public Library. Uh, so the downtown uh, building for the public library there doo -doo -doo -doo, uh, is beautiful modern architecture. At least I really like it. It's got a lot of uh, interesting lines to it when you get down to the ground levels. Pretty neat. Next up, uh, Life Extinguisher says, on my computer, full text only uses serialized execution. Oops, I'm screwing up all kinds of buttons over here. Uh, I was wondering if I could hope that it could use parallelism. <sighs> so, it's, okay, so search on, go to my blog and search for full text. Go to brentozar.com and search for full text. And you'll see blog posts that I've written about why the performance sucks. Um, you, the, usually there are a whole bunch of problems with, oh, why am I closing this? Because I got lights. I got to turn the lights on. That's what I'm doing wrong. Um, there are so many problems with SQL Server's uh, full text performance. When you get to the point where you find yourself wanting multiple CPU cores, that's your sign that really long term you need to get out of full text. Long term, you're going to need to move over something else like uh, Elasticsearch. But uh, just throwing in multiple cores isn't going to be enough to get you where you think you want to go. Next up, I, Iabetes says, it's like diabetes but different, uh, what would be the best cost-effective choice in Azure SQL for support for distributed transactions? I think that the only choice is managed instances. I don't think you do get that with Azure SQL DB or with Hyperscale. I think your only choice is managed instances. What I would what I would encourage people when they're doing distributed transactions is I would encourage them in the really long term to try to shift gears and get away from distributed transactions because there there isn't a lot of really good cost-effective solutions in the near term. But so at least there you go. Next up, uh, Wet Seal says, if there's a kind of environment where I wouldn't want to work because I don't trust myself enough, it would be a nuclear power plant. So true story, when I was a kid, I was like, I don't know, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth grades, I was completely obsessed with nuclear power plants. I read books about them. I read books about Chernobyl. I could tell you the names of the guys uh, who were working the control panel the night the incident happened. Um, I built a nuclear reactor simulation using a coffee maker. I took the heat, uh, a heat element of a coffee maker uh, and plugged that in and used it to simulate things like uranium and plutonium that were giving off heat and that they would then boil water and create steam and all that. I was obsessed with it. Um, as soon as I saw the level of education required in order to go do that kind of work, I was like, yeah, no, 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 I'm not, I suck at mathematics. It's totally, <laughs> exactly, Jenny my gorilla. That is how we made it to the FBI watch list. It is, I'm so thankful that I grew up when I did that I didn't have uh, the things like Instagram, Twitter, Snapchat, all that stuff, uh, because I totally would have been on all kinds of crazy watch lists. It's so hard to get white balance and everything working just right when the sun starts to come up, when we have these big giant windows in here. It's always so much fun. If I had a full-time camera crew, I would be all over that. I'd love that stuff. Uh, Eriker says, question number four, how would you give a, th uh, how would you give a thought on out of row storage in a heap table? Um, if you mean like off text or off row stuff like uh, Vercare Max and Vercare Max XML, 
Um, if you you really it just come comes back, ha, 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 that would be hilarious. Uh, I'm not, well, tell me what you're asking. Like instead of giving me thought, just tell me what what you're trying to solve. Like give me a, the, what the question is, because like what are your thoughts? It's just too open ended, and I'm not sure where you're going. And I could talk about that for half an hour, but let's narrow the scope down and just pick the one specific thing you're trying to do. Steve says I bet you're more competent than Homer Simpson. You have not seen me work around the house. I'm not even close. And Eldon says, have you, have you watched Chernobyl? I haven't, because I didn't subscribe to like HBO or Cinemax or any of those kinds of things. I need to at some point, but uh, Eric said 8K pages, correct. Off-row text is always stored in 8K pages as well, just groups of 8K pages. But tell, ask the question though, ask a question of what you want to know and let's go from there. Next up, uh, control K, control C. Uh, it says, what do you do when you find a SQL Server engine that dumps once or twice a month? Is it worth it to pay attention? Um, w for one memory dump, I don't usually freak out because weird things can happen uh, transitory from now and then uh, just with power, with uh, network problems, driver problems, etc. But on the second memory dump, I immediately call Microsoft support, full stop, get a call into support. Um, and I have a blog about a blog post about that, but the short answer is patch first. Patch Windows, patch your drivers, patch SQL Server, because you would hate for it to be a known issue and just flush $500 down the toilet. But once you found it, every month there are patches out for SQL Server, and so many of them say, uh, had a non-yielding scheduler, did a memory dump because of blank. People find real bugs in SQL Server all the time because they use SQL Server in crazy ways. I, look, I constantly am looking at people's code and I'm like, what, what were you drinking when you thought that this would be a good idea? Just a minute. I can only imagine what Microsoft supports uh, experiences on a daily basis. And they have to keep a poker face with y'all. At least I can be on here and like put the, put the you know, uh, lollipop down and stop playing with that thing. You know, you're going to get to sugar all over the keyboard. Don't, don't do that anymore. I can be frank like that. Microsoft support has to keep the poker face and be like, that's interesting. So why? Why did you decide to put a lollipop inside SQL Server? You know. uh, let's see. Racquetball Paul says, I heard you say treat your servers less like pets and more like cattle. What approach would you take to move in that direction? For example, use let do devs use Docker for personal DBs. The Docker is per the Docker is personal DBs thing makes sense for developers. For production servers, it tends to be things like using templates. So you use templates like whether it's Amazon uh, AMIs or Azure VM templates, uh, I forget what the names that they call those things, VMware templates, so that you have just a base Windows and SQL Server template. You can spin up a new one whenever you want, and then you have all the changes scripted that you would make in order to bring that thing into production. You check those changes into source control, and so that way if any server dies, you can just quickly pull those changes out of source control, apply them to a brand new image and you're off and rolling. To learn more about that, to learn more about that, go to Ozar, let's see here, we'll say uh, database reliability engineering. So if you search for the book Database Reliability Engineering by Leon Majors, it's an excellent book that gets you started on the work that's required uh, in order to get to that kind of uh, methodology. And I want to say that um, my book review may not come up on it right away, but if you also search for Brent Ozar, I explain how I would read it. Um, so that I give you a book review that explains what, uh, how you should read it in which ways. Eric says, I, I, I get that. Let's just don't ask me to elaborate. Ask a question. Just to be fair, I, I got to scope this, right? I can't just go on for half an hour. I've got like 20 questions, 30 questions in the queue. Ask a question, but don't have me elaborate. Just to be fair to the rest of the folks who have all these questions that are in here pending. All right, next up. <laughs> Atreus says, uh, IT manages SQL Server VM infrastructure and backups. Um, apart from the devs, da, 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 is this commonplace? Oh, oh, oh. Um, so, the, what, so you're asking how are job duties usually broken up? In very small companies, like thinking from small to, to large companies, in very small companies, think like a dentist's office with one computer. 
there's a bunch or like a, even five or ten computers there's one IT person that wears all the hats she fixes the printer she buys new keyboards she specs out the workstation she calls for support she manages everything then as the place gets bigger, as you get into places with dozens of servers, a hundred servers, whatever, the more that you have, the more job roles start to get separated out to the point where we're in your, at an enterprise, Ford, General Motors, Renault, when you're at a big giant enterprise, there are often people who just do one thing. Like you have one team that manages the backups, one team that manages the VMs. So the, the larger the company becomes, the more uh, po uh, more common that this is. Uh, next up, Kurt says the oh, the two year uh, option means you're not retiring for two more years. Yeah, I'm in my late forties now, and I'm aiming to retire when I'm fifty. By, by retire, what I mean is not being present in front of a camera at a scheduled time. That I'll do unscheduled stuff like streaming from time to time. But by the end of by the point where I'm fifty, I don't want to teach any more live classes, and I don't want to do any more consulting. So yeah, it's good for at least two more years this I'm going to do another sale in like May if I do if I also start adding EU stuff which is still up in the air depending on how the regulation works that will be the last time I do a two-year uh, option so next up let's see here uh, uh, Matten says why does SQL seem complicated compared to JavaScript it's nothing Compared to browser programming, depend compared to queue uh, working. Oh my God, it's it's so simple compared to real development. Real developers have it way harder. I look at the stuff that Richie has to do. My developer, who's Joris, who's in the the chat all the time, and he has re he has to manage huge numbers of services and frameworks and everything like that. I, I just get to do one thing. It's just pretty easy. Richie, something's broken. Go fix it. Ralph says, should I apply to the job that requires five years of experience when I have less than that? Um, the When you see a job ad, what that really is, is it's like a relationship classified. Think about your ideal partner. Boy, I, what I could say next could put me in a real bad place. Um, I'll, I'll, okay, I'll give you a good example. If Erica passed away, so my wife, we've been together for over 20 years. If my wife passed away, I could write an ad that says, I want someone who, and I would just have a whole list of things that are exactly like her, and that would be the end of it, because I'm old, and I don't want to change anything. I'm kind of stuck in my ways. Um, so I would write a job ad that looks exactly like everything about her. In reality, you would take something different because things are going to change over the course of your life. That might be a wish list for you. Now, me personally, just as far as I'm concerned, if my wife passes away, I'm done. I'm never getting in another relationship ever again. I am done. No way. I will be the crotchety old person. I won't even be crotchety. I'll be ecstatic. I love my life. I'm having a really good time. I would probably just have a whole lot more cars when there would be no one to tell me no. Francois says, what is your feeling about the extensive use of no lock? What side effects could occur by doing this? Well, if you search for a Brent Ozar no lock, there's a demo out on YouTube where I show you how you get incorrect query results. So go to YouTube and search for Brent Ozar no lock, and I have a 30 second demo that shows how you get incorrect query results. So now I'm going to say something that seems goofy. If you don't need accuracy in your query results, no lock is fine, which sounds like I'm, I'm joking, but I'm not. So for example, I have one uh, very popular e-commerce retailer online that they just need to make sure sales are going through. That's all they care about is just a query to make sure, are we selling stuff? So they constantly run monitoring queries with no lock just to make sure that data is moving through all the different processes. If no rows show up, two queries in a row, they know they have a problem, but they don't care about like transactional accuracy about exactly how much the sales were. No lock, it's totally okay for that kind of situation. Athena says, how to create an inventory system very carefully. Very, very carefully. 
Uh, Control K, Control C says, when you're busy dealing with customer complex problems, what do you usually eat to compensate for the energy consumed? Uh, turkey jerky. So funny you say that. When I'm working with client calls, I work 45 to 60 minutes at a time, never longer than 45 to 60 minutes uh, at a time. And then I'll say, okay, we're going to take a quick bio break, you know, 15 minutes to go walk around, go, uh, you know, relieve yourself, go get new water, coffee, whatever. And during that time, I go get a turkey jerky stick. We buy, a Verm I think it's called Vermont Farms uh, turkey jerky from Amazon. And they have uh, specifically sugar-free they have sugar-free turkey jerky. It doesn't taste great, doesn't taste fantastic, but it totally takes care of the uh, energy type problem. Works really well. It's funny that I have an answer for that. It's kind of weird. Camila says, have you ever seen a successful migration from SQL to NoSQL? With rewriting the app, yes. Not with the same app, but rewriting a brand new app. Like we have this legacy system, it, doesn't, it does exactly what we want, but we need to rewrite it to be more web 2.0, we're gonna put it in the cloud, whatever, and we, we're gonna consciously make a design decision to go with, say, DynamoDB. Um, uh, DFW, I use OBS, OBS. So that works completely fine. Ha <laughs> ha, does retirement mean changing tires? Retirement probably means I would love to do the thing that Jay Leno kind of pivoted to, but of course on a way lower budget. Uh, Jay Leno, the American talk show host, when he retired, he just started streaming and uh, doing TV shows about stuff that's inside his car collection. I wouldn't go quite to that extreme, but I would probably go to the level of Heidi and Franny's garage out on YouTube. I love that channel. Uh, Erica says, what is your interview question number one? Mine is the same as Jeff Moden's. How do you display the current date and time? Oh, so mine is, tell me about the last problem that you're, or the problem that you're working on solving right now at work. Like, I don't, I don't want specifics about the company or anything like that. I don't want you to give away anything that's NDA, but tell me about the problem that you're trying to solve right now when you go back to the office. That tells you so much more about someone's experience level, uh, what they're hitting their heads against, and I will try to help them. I'll be like, okay, so if I was in your shoes, here's what I would go do next. Have you tried those? And we'll, we'll talk through that. But that way, it's, it's not about the job I'm trying to hire them for. It's me getting to know them very quickly and also help them feel comfortable. I don't want to make, if they're like, oh, I'm trying to figure out how to get one equals, you know, set one plus one or whatever, or build a dynamic SQL string. I, do, I don't ever want to judge them in a negative way. I want to give them help as I'm doing it, but I also want to see how they take that help, how they respond to it, because after all, that's going to be what they're doing in the job is that they're going to be uh, 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 getting. See, I don't like typical day. This sounds goofy, but I don't like typical day because no one ever has a typical day. It's always so much more like, tell me what you're doing right now, because you'll see people put like, 50 things on their resume. I fix clusters and replication and log shipping and I build new backup systems and I write new stored procedures. Listen, enough with the buzzword bingo. Tell me what you're doing right now. And that really helps. Uh, Athena says, how do you create an ER diagram? If you Google for that one, there are a bunch of open source diagramming tools. I actually personally don't do it. Um, and I don't like a lot of uh, when I when I run into clients, it's extremely rare that people have an up-to-date ERD. Uh, they have an ERD that someone made 20 years ago when they were first starting the project, but the thing is totally outdated. It doesn't reflect the way the database works today. So the, the people that I know that do do ER diagrams, they either work for giant companies and it's like their full-time job, or else they're consultants who are just trying to get billable rates for something. They're like, well, we should start by creating an ERD. That'll keep me busy for a week or two, and I can bill you for it. And I'm like, ah, yeah. Uh, Anna Rooch says, what book do you suggest to study execution plans? I, I'll show you the blog post that I wrote about that. <laughs> So if you go to brentozar.com slash go slash books, 
So if you go to brentozar.com slash go slash books, you're going to get my recommended list of SQL Server books as of this year. And in there, I walk you through books that I would l use for T-SQL, execution plans, indexing, database administration, and all that. So brentozar.com slash go slash books. And then, of course, I would be a bad database administrator, a bad consultant, if I didn't also point out that I have uh, a sale running for Bre Black Friday. If you go to brentozar.com slash Black Friday, I have a fundamentals of query tuning class and a mastering query tuning class. Because I don't like books. I can't learn from books worth a damn. I had one SQL Server book on my nightstand. I'm not even kidding you. This is a real actual thing. For four years. I had a book on my nightstand for four years and I couldn't get through it. Because I would open it and I would fall asleep within five pages. The book sucked. It was just absolutely terrible. And I get that it was just uh, very clear in terms of resources, but it was just boring as hell. There's no humor. It was dry. So I, I tried taking it somewhere else. I tried putting it on my coffee table, and I just could not motivate myself to finish the damn thing. And I know a lot of people like that who are like, well, I have It's Ben Gon's books. And I'm like, oh, have you ever finished it? It's really big. I'm like, yeah, see, yeah, it's kind of different. So that's why I do training classes, and I try to have fun inside those. And then I am not saying Itzik's book was one of the ones I couldn't finish. I adore Itzik's stuff. His stuff is magical. He's a great presenter. It's very good. Just a awesome, awesome books. <laughs> mom, mom. so this is my mom here. Cynthia Hines says, you used to read a lot growing up. You used to flashlight at night. Yeah, I, she's not saying, but I also used to flashlight at day, too, because I wasn't all that bright. <laughs> All right, so next up, uh, Erica says, what's the name of that book? No, I, I can't tell you that one. That, one's, that one would get me in trouble. Francois says, how do you convince clients with old versions of SQL Server to upgrade? I don't work for them. Sounds terrible, right? But I just go, sorry, if you don't, if you can't get support from Microsoft, if Microsoft refuses to support that SQL Server, I won't support it either. And they're like, but, 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 but. I'm like, if you want someone who will do, who will take your money to do things that Microsoft refuses to take your money to do, you can go Google. There will be plenty of other consultants who will do that kind of dirty work. I am not going to do that because if I get in trouble, we got to be able to call Microsoft for help. If you can't even call Microsoft, I'm out of here. I'm done. So it's lucky. I'm lucky to have that. But, you know, there we go. Zaki says, uh, it makes sense. No kid grows up wanting to be a SQL Server database consultant. No, and um, the only person, I'm sure there are others, but the only person that I know who went straight from uh, college or high school over to databases is Tara Kaiser. Tara Kaiser that works for Straight Path SQL. She lives here in San Diego, actually, but came out of uh, college and immediately went into database administration because a friend of hers uh, that she knew was hiring DBAs. Uh, she's the only person I know who's only ever been a database administrator, and she's really good at it, you know, very brilliant, sharp database administrator. Uh, Mike L says, I have an interview at Microsoft tomorrow, customer support DBA. Any last minute recommendations? Be humble, and when you don't know something, say you don't know. Don't BS. Like immediately, when someone asks you something you don't know, lead with, I don't know that, but I'll tell you where I would look, and here are the things that I would look for. Like I would bing for, <laughs> see what I did there, I didn't, I didn't say Google. I would bing for these terms, and I would expect to see results from these websites, and then here's how, what I would do uh, next. But do not try to uh, uh, BS your way through that at all. Biggest thing that I could possibly give you there. Yeah, because people at Microsoft often know way more than you think they're going to know there. Francois, uh, or Francis, Francis says, uh, you're above the library, but the big question, do you have a library card? No, I did as a kid, but the problem with libraries today is that there's, I mean, there may be multiple problems, but the, the problem that stands out the most to me is that they're full of homeless people right now. And so they don't smell great. It's not a great experience. So I tend to just buy books on my iPad and uh, use, I usually use the Kindle app, but yeah. 
Uh, Oleg says, good morning. What do you what do you think about set versus select uh, in order to set a variable? I noticed that select will appear. It's not that bad. No, it's not. Between the two of them, I don't care. Uh, the, the thing that gets me is when people do a select and they don't do top one with an order by, like that they expect whatever comes out of the select to be unique when they're going and hitting tables and often will hit cases where their select returns multiple rows and they have no idea which row they're actually getting because it can change at any time. Uh, let's see here. Malik. Oh, good to see you, Malik. Uh, says, what do I look for first when always on is in a resolving state and what is my least timeout? The first thing that I'll go look at is the logs. So SQL servers, error logs, and the cluster logs. And typically when we talk about least timeouts, it's problems connecting to DNS. Like there's something broken with the DNS or active directory infrastructure. But I would just always check the logs, so the, uh, the error logs first, because that's, that's, that's where they log the errors. Thus, thus the name. And next up, Jedi Mind Gorilla says, uh, "Holy carp! Uh, highest temps in July in Iceland are 57 degrees Fahrenheit. I would have a wife popsicle." So it's really interesting how they do this. So Iceland is basically built on top of volcanoes, so they get essentially free electricity and free hot water from all the geothermal stuff happening inside there. So they run hot water through most of the country practically for free and their electricity rates often you'll hear people in Europe describe Iceland's electricity as cheap but it's really not that much different from the United States it's just the US has really cheap electricity so it doesn't seem that bad I've seen a lot of houses in Iceland where people just leave windows open all year round because the, they heat the floors with this free hot water and they get all this uh, free energy so it's really neat how that the whole thing works um, we also like sleeping at like 60 degrees Fahrenheit. So it works out pretty well for us. We tend to like it uh, chilly. The thing is, we just like daylight. Like I like big, you know, streaming daylight outside. I'm a huge fan of daylight. And so in Iceland, that's exactly, I love that saying. Erica says, in, who's from Iceland, there's no bad weather, only the wrong clothing. Now, there, of course, uh, the, the winters are a little rough, uh, especially short days and very long nights. Uh, but as long as you don't uh, mind that, it's not so bad. So. Next up, Gaunt says, why do we have no memory grant in the plan, but we see a work table with many reads? If you want, paste, uh, paste the execution plan over at pastetheplan.com pastetheplan.com, put the actual execution plan over there, and then ask that on dba.stackexchange.com and people can give you more detailed answers. I don't have a demo that I can show you quickly to illustrate it, so unfortunately I'm not a good fit for that here in a Q&A webcast. TZ Coder over on YouTube asks, that never, surly dev, that never gets old, uh, do you see in-memory optimized tables in production? What are they good for? War! What is it good for? Absolutely nothing. Uh, so that's not, it's not true that it's absolutely nothing. It's, uh, so I, the only places where I've ever seen them in production, people have been trying to tear them out. So that's, uh, that kind of is my experience there. Um, so this, so this was the theory for it. CTI Geek says we use memory tables for sessions. CTI Geek, though, you have to be warned, is extremely rich. I mean, just loaded with cash. Everybody else in the world would have used any one of a number of open source free tools, free databases that are designed to hold session state, things like Redis. Uh, but because he is so flush with cash, they don't mind spending uh, $7,000 a core for Enterprise Edition to handle session state. The rest of us who aren't quite as, as lucky as CTI Geek. Now, you may, if you're on Twitch, you may want to check with him because maybe he's hiring. See, there he goes. Good, good money. Next up, Francois says, what is an example that you have worked on where a single change to a query or to SQL Server configuration had the greatest effect in terms of performance? Let me show you. SQL Server has two magic buttons, two not like a dog's butt. My, my relatives used to say that the, the, you know, the little brown circle at the back of a dog, they used to call that the magic button. And they said if you could touch the magic button, the dog would give you a prize. <laughs> it's, it's not entirely true. 
in, in SQL Server, we get two magic buttons, and I'll show them to you. You don't want to hit them all the time. They're for very specific purposes. But if I right click, let's see, let's go over to the Stack Overflow database, right click on the Stack Overflow database, go into Options, and one of the magic buttons is this right here, is read committed snapshot on. When you turn this from false to true, this turns on optimistic concurrency, aka uh, MVCC, where readers don't block writers and writers don't block readers. People constantly use no lock because they think it's going to get them around blocking problems. This is the setting that they really should have read about. This is the one that's baller. I've had clients with awesome, huge blocking problems, and I've said, watch this, Ta -da! push this button, and then all of a sudden, all the blocking fell away. There are big dangers with that. It's not a button that you want to use uh, all the time, uh, but it's the kind of thing where it will make an amazing difference if you have exactly the right circumstances. The other one is right below it is parameterization. So if you have a situation where, <laughs> Jedi, my girl. Uh, so if you have a situation where applications are sending in unparameterized strings, uh, like they're not using variables in any of their queries and they're not using stored procedures, uh, this will help you magically change their strings that are chalk loaded with literals into uh, very, uh, uh, parameterized strings. If you change this over to forced, um, all of a sudden, your SQL Server will be able to reuse execution plans where it didn't before. I've had cases where servers have been 80 to 95% CPU due to constantly compiling queries. We change this little magic button here, all of a sudden CPU goes down to say 10, 15%. With both of these settings, they can backfire terribly, just like the magic button on the dog's rear end. It's actually a really good example, and I think I'm going to use that uh, from here on. Uh, coming back next up, let's see here, Steve. Steve says, I'm terrified of Brent retiring. It would just only be the live classes. Like, I would still do recorded stuff. It's just that I, I, I like getting drunk. I like getting drunk at unpredictable times. Oh, Michael J. Swart is here! Ladies and gentlemen, Michael J. Swart! Uh, I, and I'm totally embarrassing him, probably. Uh, he says, can vouch for RCSI. I used to blog about block process reports. I seriously uh, pointed somebody to that. This, was it on a recent webcast? I think it was on a stream recently. It was either on a stream or it was a client problem. I can't quite remember which one it was. Uh, Andrea says, what is the best way to insert several rows of data at the same time? My friend tested this and saw some improvement into with uh, listed uh, values. So another way to do it would be to dump the stuff into a temp table and then insert from the temp table over into the real table. Uh, that's one way to do it. Th those are two the, probably the two common ways between the two. In terms of which ones are best, it's going to depend on the structure of the table that you're using. Um, like, for example, if you have triggers on there, if you have lots of indexes on there, if there's foreign keys between them, it's a pretty uh, big, uh, huge question. Uh, Francois says, do you have any thoughts on South Africa just for fun? I No, no, uh, no, no. I know a lot of former South Africans who moved to the United States, and I have heard the stories about the violence and the guns and all that, and I'm like, nope. Uh, it is a beautiful country, but uh, yeah, no, not for me. Uh, next one, Eric says, I've had a requirement recently in the last few weeks. Do you have four plus years on SQL Server 2019? And they say it with a totally straight face, too. We need someone with 10 years of experience on NoSQL. And I'm like, but, but did you? It's pretty new, you know, are you sure that actually works? Um, so, and uh, uh, K the Blade Runner says, if you enable RCSI, remember how I said it had a lot of gotchas? Oh yeah, you weren't listening to that part. You just wanted to type and see your name on screen. Well, you know what? I don't blame you for wanting to put your name on screen. K the Blade Runner, it's a great name. I like it a lot, but next time, the Lord gave you two ears and one mouth. Also, he gave you 10 fingers. Ah, I that doesn't work very well at all. Uh, next up, let's see here. TJ Davy says, have the best practices move on since Jeremiah wrote this blog post in 2015? Um, I want to get one terabyte of blobs. I don't suppose to, uh, I want to do this before. Ta -ta -ta -ta. Um, 
uh, no. Uh, no, his, that, the best practices haven't changed since then. Um, I can see why you want to get rid of blobs, because evidently your organization is riddled with problems with very long strings. So, um, Fred says, do you know any open source migration tools for SQL Server? I would want to know more about what you mean by migration tools. I'm thinking that you mean ETL. Uh, I think that you mean ETL like extract, transform, and load tools. There is an open source ETL tool. I can't remember what it is. Um, oh, I don't, Penta something? That might, Pentaho was the BI tool. Now, there's another open source uh, tool for ETL. Bimmel script, I think, is to some extent open source uh, would be one way about it. But the thing that I would probably ask is what, what uh, are you migrating from and to? Is it a one-time migration or a regular job that you want to set up? Um, yeah, it, it's really a more of a whole project thing than it is a quick question. So I would want to know more about what migration means. Uh, whew, Zaki says, do you know any good resources for integrating SQL Server with IBM Watson? So just from what I've read on stuff like Hacker News, IBM Watson seems like it's the biggest sham on the planet, like it's just a trick for IBM to sell consulting services. Uh, so no, I haven't seen anyone integrate it. I've only heard of reports of horror out of implementing IBM Watson, so unfortunately, no. Uh, Bramajam says, what's the best method to migrate from SQL Server to MySQL? Unfortunately, you have to rewrite your entire code base because odds are uh, you are, uh, you have written code in T-SQL that isn't compatible with MySQL, that you're doing things inside queries or data types is another one where the data types are different. So really the, the thing that people do when they change from one database back into the other is they really have to go through and rewrite all the queries in their application. You have to examine every query uh, and then understand whether it's doing anything that isn't compatible with MySQL. The investment required in order to do that is pretty spectacular. Usually you're talking about millions of dollars worth of uh, employee time, so it's fairly rare to see. Uh, Venkatarama, Venkataramanana, oh, that's an awesome name, says, if I compress a table using page compression, I get stuff back. Does creating a column store also uh, compress the table? Yes. Uh, and in order to learn more about that, go check out my fundamentals of column store class. In my fundamentals of column store class, I explain what kinds of data get good corruption, um, doo -doo 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 -doo. Uh, what kinds of tables get good corruption, what kinds of co uh, compression, <laughs> compression, what kinds of compression you should expect, what you can do in order to change the compression that you're getting. That's in my fundamentals of column store class, and you can go get that today uh, during my Black Friday sale. That's over at brentozar.com slash black. Black Friday, one day class there on fundamentals of column store. Um, uh, and Max says, I killed a family of five and now I'm an orphan. So that's kind of tricky though. Did you, did you kill your own family? Did you kill someone else's family of five? And then they like came back and they were like, oh, my name is Inigo Montoya. You killed my father, prepare to die. And then they killed your parents instead of you. I have so many questions that could go in a lot of interesting ways. So next up, uh, Control-K, Control-C says, how many years should I work as a SQL Server DBA to buy a Porsche 911 Turbo? Well, the good news is now that they're all turbos. Like, turbo is just a marketing name that they put on the highest end one. So the lowest end 911, it's about $80,000 US. If you saved $8,000 a year for like seven years with interest, you could pay cash for one. So it's not really that bad. I will say that's, that's just the general Porsche 911 Carrera, not the, uh, not the turbo. Um, but the real full-blown turbo, $200,000, that is a, a hell of an investment. The thing that you do, though, with Porsches is, is you, not me, but the thing that most people do with Porsches is that they lease them because they have really good resale value. So it does actually resale, if you're going to go buy a new one, lease it rather than buy it. But the thing you would really want to do is go buy yourself one of the 997s. Let's go see. Right so if you search for, let's close this. 
And he, he started, this is the ones with gr uh, joking questions get all the most detailed answers, right? Um, but Doug, was it Doug? No, it was Hoovy. Uh, Hoovy's Garage, best Porsche 911. Um, so Hoovy is, that's it right there. He says, here's why the most hated 911 Turbo is also the best. There's one generation of 911 Turbos that has this frying egg kind of look to the headlights. So it's cheaper because people don't like the way that it looks, but it's an amazing bargain. You can pick these things up for like 30 grand, like the price of a, a Toyota Camry, and they're reliable. They go like stink. They're just fantastic. And one thing that I would say, because I'm going to go on on this, <laughs> is that Steve, Steve Jones, the fa one of the founders of SQL Saturday, of SQLServerCentral.com, gave me the, like, the best advice around Porsches. He said, look, don't wait. Just go buy the one that you can't quite afford today. Just go buy it. And it's going to make a difference in your life. It will uh, really, it, it'll be a journey that you enjoy, even though you can't really afford it. There's never a good time to do it. But go buy a used one and don't obsess over it. Just go get it now while you can. Because the older that you get, the, the less attractive they are. They're real down to the ground. They, you know, howl in terms of noise. They're not practical, all kinds of stuff. Uh, next up, Francois says, can you explain how unordered prefetching affects query performance? Not really, not, not quickly. Sorry, I should have read that before I put it up there. No, it's not something quick that I can answer here. Um, Sonraco says, what's a SQL server? You know how, you, and I'm going to answer this seriously. You know how you go to an ATM, like an automated teller? You go to an ATM, you put your card in, two things have to happen. You have to get the money that you're allowed to get, and they have to deduct it from your account. Both of those things have to happen, and they have to happen quickly. A database is where they keep the data that makes that stuff possible. So the people inside this stream, what our life is, is we're really focused on how do we make sure that those transactions happen as quickly as possible and that the server doesn't go down, that when you walk up to the ATM, that it's actually there, you know, that you can, you can do your transactions against it. Everywhere in the world has data, all over the place, online newspapers, just this thing that you're typing into here, that data has to live somewhere, and that's what we do. We manage where the data goes, and we buy Porsches, and we drink a lot. Uh, let's see here, Frankie Peanut, I love it. Frankie Peanut says, is it worth me trying to cram an exam before they're discontinued, or should I look at some of the new accreditations? It depends on when you need the cert. If you're in, gonna be in a job hunt in the next six months, go get the cert now, because old certs are really easy to uh, find study materials on. They're much easier to pass, and more recruiters will be looking for those terms. Whereas if you go get the new cutting edge ones, there's going to be less certification material out and less recruiters will be looking for them. So I would go race in and just slam dunk it over there real quick. Uh, next up, Sudhir says, how common do you see facts and dimensions defined in a data warehouse? Our data warehouse is more like a repository. All the data is dumped in as is. The term that you're looking for is called a data lake. A data lake is where when companies just dump all kinds of stuff in uh, into an area and then they kind of refine it in the reporting tool rather than refine it in the database schema. Data lakes are very uh, common and popular these days to the point where a lot of companies aren't even putting it inside a relational database. They're just dumping it in like XML and JSON files out on a file store somewhere. That trend started around Hadoop timelines. And these days, there, there are all kinds of uh, tools that support that. So data swamps, too, yes, so especially the kind of data that I deal with. Carmina Piranha says, I'm a librarian watching your stream and wanted to let you know that libraries have a lot to offer you besides their physical spaces. Um, also, uh, your take on libraries being an unpleasant experience because of homeless people is a gross take. I understand where you're coming from, but in Southern California, the homeless population is pretty epic, as in... Down there, where I was pointing to with the with the uh, the library, there was a murder about three weeks ago on the front steps of the library. 
one homeless person shot another in broad daylight. Now I get that my take is a little bit gross. I don't want to die today. So tomorrow, maybe, but not today. Drug use is really rampant too as well. Not, not amongst homeless people, just down sound, uh, San Diego downtown. Well, it's, you know, it's a pleasant place to be homeless. Um, a symbiotic DB says, uh, have you ever seen spatial objects scaled up? It seems like a nice feature, but I wonder if this could use, be used for large databases. So I uh, have, I worked recently, two months ago? Two months ago with a client, very big client, uh, doing exactly that. So yes, by all means I have. Um, I don't think it's the easiest thing in the world, but I think with a lot of SQL Server projects start really small and then they grow and then they, they catch scale that way. So yeah, I have seen it. I, it wouldn't be my first spot. I would, if you were gonna go build a spatial project from scratch today, I'd throw you towards Postgres rather than I would SQL Server. But if you have an existing relational database proje process or project, then it kind of sort of makes sense to leave it in SQL Server. They're not doing a lot of fixes to it or improvements to it. So you can kind of smell, you know, if the code isn't being improved very quickly, that's kind of a bad sign. A drop table, uh, drop table employee says, Brent's love classes are full of these uh, tidbits. It's true. I teach classes about relationships and sex and all kinds of stuff. Drop Table Employees has been through those, and it's amazing. I want to give him a hand because he's done a great job uh, making progress. When he first came to me, all he could do is hate. Now he loves all the time. In fact, he loves so much, you probably shouldn't stand close to him. That's that's why that how that works. Uh, Wajik, uh, welcome to the club. Uh, Ender 3 says, I don't even do this for a living. Brent is just entertaining. Uh, thank you. I'm glad you like it. I have a lot of fun, a ton of fun doing these things. Ooh, I am an angry gumball, says. There are problems with too many query plans being created and being redundant. However, the CPU on the server rarely goes over 50%, so I don't think that there is an issue investing worth time towards. Do you agree? Okay, two things. First off, never, ever, ever tell people, do you agree? It's passive aggressive and it sounds kind of shitty. Wouldn't you agree? Um, so, and I try not to swear, but of course I just did there. Uh, but second, it, it still, still actually is a problem because the reason why is when all these unparameterized queries go flooding through your plan cache, they will push other plans out of the cache. Uh, so that's the thing that I run into most often when that wiring fires or when that warning fires is that people's plan caches have amnesia because SQL Server doesn't have an unlimited amount of space in which to store execution plans. And so an important query that doesn't run very often constantly gets new uh, plans created every time it runs. So. Uh, all right, next up. Oops, so we already saw that one. Let me go delete that one. Um, doo -doo 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 -doo. Oh, interesting. I'm an angry gumball says uh, we're integrating Watson right now. I had to send some production data to IBM and they created a predictive model for it. So I guess we will see how successful it is. Hey, and it won Jeopardy, right? I mean, I guess it can't be. Maybe you're working on winning Jeopardy. So I guess maybe that's it. B News says, are there any known bugs with SQL Server 2017? There are tons. If you go to sqlserverupdates.com, sqlserverupdates.com is where I publish my uh, releases of every time a cumulative update comes out, I list out the most important bugs inside there and why you probably want to patch. The bugs that aren't fixed yet aren't public. So you would have to call Microsoft and they just don't simply give out a list of here are all the known bugs with SQL Server. But the answer is yes. Steven says, do you get frustrated with the incorrect use of CTEs, especially from devs? No, no, not really. Um, I don't know what you mean by incorrect use of CTEs. I'm, I'm not sure uh, what you would mean by incorrect, because I see incorrect results of all kinds of stuff, incorrect uses of uh, all kinds of stuff, regular tables, uh, joins, indexes, all that stuff. So uh, does any one feature, uh, yeah, not really. That doesn't uh, give me any heartburn. Uh, over on YouTube, Billalarla says, I've been working with a lot of trees, um, like recursive CTEs. Debugging those queries are such hill. In, any hints on how to debug those? Not recursive CTEs. I don't have to use them very often. That's a really good question. I don't have any tips on them. It's, it's not that they're bad. It's totally okay. It's just that I don't really have any tips off the top of my head on how to debug them. So. 
Uh, next up, Howarth says, do you see cases where f clients favor a cloud vendor's implementation of storage encryption, any advantage of choosing TDE over volume encryption? So the reason why some folks will leave it, leave the encryption to the storage layer is they just want to check a box. They just want to tell their auditors, yes, our stuff is encrypted at rest. It's not really encrypted worth a damn. You can still take a backup and you can write that backup any direction where you want to write it to. Like you can write it to Azure Blob Storage and people can't stop you. And wherever you write that backup to, it's completely unencrypted. So, yeah, yeah not for me, that's not that useful. Uh, the advantage of TDE is that not only is it encrypted at rest on disk, but it's also encrypted wherever you write the backups to as long as you don't keep the keys, the certs, right next to the backups, because then if somebody gets both of those, they can decrypt everything, and that's the end of that. Eric Kerr says, uh, question number 42, how can RCSO, and I think you mean RCSI, change the performance on a resource strap server? So with RCSI, SQL Server starts tracking uh, updates and deletes over in the version store. That's additional load on TempDB that it didn't have before. So I've seen cases where SQL Server already had a ton of TempDB problems, and then they started running out of space and TempDB's performance was so bad that they couldn't uh, sustain it, RCSI in production. Uh, Francois or Francis says, serious question, thank God, because all these questions so far have just been hilarious. Uh, if you had unlimited money, what do you mean if? Do you see these clothes? It's not true. This is like from a discount store on Isle of Man. Isle of Man always has really cool outdoors clothes. It's kind of weird. Um, if you had unlimited money, how would you set up your backups uh, like a NAS with log shipping replication? So the way that I would set up my backups is I would have two active data or two data centers that were both accessible at any time. I would take full backups in both data centers. I would write those full backups to a write-only file share. Uh, storage vendors make write-only file shares where you can't delete things, you can't uh, uh, modify them in any way. So this gives you a lot of ransomware protection so that it's not accessible to that ransomware. Then in whichever database that I choose to do my log backups in, I would also do those to a write only, uh, uh, write once, read many type device. So at least that way it would wall off the problems with ransomware that goes through and encrypts file shares or tries to delete stuff across file shares. And then uh, that doesn't include like high availability and disaster recovery. That's just how the backups would work. Uh, Richard says, we have always on with readable replicas. Are we paying the TempDB versioning price? You are on the secondaries, but not on the primaries. Uh, snapshot isolation is how the secondaries allow queries to read at the same time that write activity is happening as well. A uh, quick shout out to our another round of applause for Surly Dev for managing all of y'all's questions. Y'all are going crazy with the questions today. It's wonderful. Uh, so uh, if it wasn't for Surly Dev, we would not be able to keep up with the flood of incoming questions from y'all. So Surly Dev is the hero who keeps copy pasting your stuff around. And every time you see something that says over on YouTube, he's heroically copying that data around. Uh, next up, let's see, um, Adam says, what's your preferred method to update a SQL Server schema, state-based, uh, migration-based, or a hybrid mix? I don't do version control for, uh, let me, ooh, ooh, I said that incorrectly. I don't get to make architectural decisions for version control for databases. It's just not the area that I specialize in. And um, earlier I gave you all the advice with Microsoft. I said, hey, look, remember, always say I don't know. Always be clear about what I don't. I know the differences between those. I have never been in a situation where I've had to choose. I'll tell you that Richie, the developer on our team, uh, manages all that for us when for our AWS uh, Aurora Postgres type stuff. So I just don't have any prefer, uh, preference between the two. They're both hard. Like I've sat in Alex Yates's sessions at conferences like group buys. Alex Yates is kind of our industry expert on, I say our as in the, he works in the industry. He doesn't work for me. He's brilliant, he's a really smart guy. Um, 
but he's he's the person in our industry who does sessions on that kind of thing, Alex Yates. And if you search for those terms, he has a free session out at Group Buy that explains the pros and cons of each of those. It's really good. I like it a lot. Uh, Erica from Iceland says, uh, question number uh, 667. Uh, often, uh, simple changes make a big difference. Max stop, order by, I've learned to reduce execution plan just by reducing parallelism. Any examples? I have a ton of those in, you know this is coming. <laughs> My training classes over in Fundamentals of Query Tuning and Mastering Query Tuning, I actually give the students uh, examples where they have to go solve problems inside the Stack Overflow database. They're all working along inside their own VMs, and they have to replicate performance problems with a query and then go figure out how to change it. Sometimes the fix is rewriting queries. Sometimes it's indexes. Sometimes it's server level changes. And in each of the examples in Fundamentals and Mastering Query Tuning, I'll give them different restrictions and say, all right, in this one, you're not allowed to change the indexes. In this one, you're not allowed to change the queries and so forth. So that is my fundamentals of query tuning and mastering query tuning classes. They're on sale this week over during uh, Black Friday. <laughs> Let's see here. Uh, next. Oh, uh, Basic says, and I really like the way you typed your name. That's kind of cool. Basic says, is SQL Server 2019 worth upgrading to? Oh, this is a tricky question. There are things in SQL Server 2019 that I like a lot. Batch mode execution on row store tables is a great example. But SQL Server 2019 is also chock full of nuts. There have been so many bugs in SQL Server 2019 to the point where Cumulative Update 7, they had to yank it because of quality control problems and they never would tell us exactly what it was. They actually told people to uninstall it from production. Then they shipped Cumulative Update 8 after that in order to fix it. And they're now like 28 days late on the next Cumulative Update. I am teetering on the edge of writing a blog post saying to the public, I don't think you should update to SQL Server 2019 because I don't think it's ready yet because we still keep having all of these performance issues and bug issues. Um, Francois says, what's in your cup? Espresso. Uh, espresso. I love the taste of espresso. And I need more espresso. And I'm right on the edge of whether or not I should go make more because we're kind of almost out of time. At 8 o'clock, my coffee shop, it's not mine, but the coffee shop downstairs opens and I'm going to go down there and get a lox and bagel. Their kitchen was supposed to open at 7.30, but they didn't yesterday, so I'm not quite going down there just yet. Uh, Sashin says, can we do performance tuning of a query from the estimated plan or is the actual plan mandatory to have? The more that you know about your data, the more you can use an estimated plan. For example, I know the Stack Overflow database so well now from working with it on training classes that I can go, when I look at a query plan, I can look at the estimated number of rows and I can go, that part right there is wrong. Like more rows or less rows are going to come out of that operator based on the parameters of the query and what the, the shape of the plan looks like. The less you know about the database, the more you have to get the actual execution plan. Uh, next up, uh, Elton says, are you planning to keep your enterprise when you retire? Yes, I'll continue to do passive income. I'm a huge believer in passive income, and we will um, uh, continue to sell recorded class training. I just wouldn't do live class training. Um, it says, maybe promoting one employee to become the new big boss. Well, I only have two employees. It's my wife, Erica, and Richie. And so between the two of them, obviously, it can't be Erica. It's not that she's not smart enough to be the boss. She just wants to retire at the same time that I retire. So if anything, it would be Richie, and he's not going to want to work with SQL Server either. So, um, But no, we'll be working with it for forever part-time. It's just that I wouldn't, I, when I say retire, my version of retirement is kind of just that I would continue to work. I would just not work actively on, like, live classes or with clients. I would just pick the days and times when I want to work and just go write uh, training material. Uh, Francois says, what's the largest SQL Server database you've ever encountered, and is there anything to bear in mind when uh, the databases exceed a certain size? 
when you get over a terabyte, backup and recovery tends to be a lot harder. Performance management starts to become a lot harder. The, the biggest one, that biggest server that I've worked on was, I want to say like 85 to 90 terabytes in size. Um, I've had clients try to hire me for larger ones, but I haven't been able to make it work either due to their scheduling or the problems that they had on the server. Uh, but I've seen servers that have had a petabyte of data on the individual SQL server. Uh, let's see, Quao says, what is your opinion on Snowflake? I see a lot of companies switching to it. It gets a lot of good press for data warehouses for brand new built data warehouses from scratch. I haven't used it myself. I looked at it maybe three, four, five uh, years ago when it first started coming out. And um, I'm like, oh, that looks like an interesting technology. But because I chose to specialize in SQL Server, I just never got deeper than that. I haven't heard anything bad about it, though. The, the things that I've heard about it are all good. Darman says our SQL, our data warehouse needs, needs to send out thousands of subscriptions. These are identical queries with different parameters and end up blocking each other. Should we test out snapshot isolation? Yes. So that's an easy answer. Yes, you should totally try that out. Uh, oh, Francois says, not a question, but it, since it's my first time enjoying your live answers, I'd just like to extend a compliment. You've been a big influence to me. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you. Um, my whole goal is to make this database administration thing easier for other people than it was for me on my way up. So, you know, continuing to pay it forward. So I'm glad I could uh, do that. <laughs> Andy talking about uh, Andy Leonard. Good to see you. Says talking about uh, SQL Server 2019. Says there are also a couple of issues with SSIS 2019 as well. I look at my watch because so I'm up in a high rise and uh, from time to time a GPS thinks that I left the building and then I came back in. So Siri's all, it's time to wash your hands. You need to get started washing your hands. I'm like, how do you the questions are bad, but they're not quite that bad. They're not quite that bad. Uh, control K, Control C says, have you experienced configuring Polybase? No. If yes, how hard was it for a professional like you, amateur like me? Um, does this composition work? I'm going to get myself in trouble. I do not understand for the life of me why on earth someone would want to pay SQL Server licensing to use Hadoop. The beauty of stuff like open source solutions is that they scale out for nearly free. Why would you want to pay $7,000 a, a core for SQL Server to use Hadoop? I, I just, it boggles my mind. Oh, I get why Microsoft's trying to sell it, because they want some of that sweet, juicy money. I just do not understand why. And so every now and then you'll see Microsoft doing uh, road shows of, we got Corporation X right here to go use Polybase and Hadoop. Let's talk about what their experience was like. But what you don't often see is that they usually got their licensing for free in exchange for doing that kind of promo. Sometimes Microsoft will even give them free consulting in order to do the implementation. I, I've not seen a lot of good real-world use cases for Polybase that involved paying full price on the licensing. Just seems kind of odd. Uh, well, Raspberry Pi, you're not scaling up, you know, say, uh, Polybase on now that. Uh, Banu says, could you please do a brief explanation of fragmentation? D uh, no, not live, but if you search for my name and fragmentation on YouTube, especially since you're on YouTube, I have a 90-minute video out there from Group Buy where I go into, uh, uh, oh, that's true. Oh, I totally, oh, I got I to gotta go look and see how that works. But, oh, that's a good, I'm certainly, Dev, I'm glad you said that. So what we'll do is at like 7.55, Andy, you should start your stream. And then what will happen is after you start your stream, uh, we'll go raid you, which means that we'll go transfer over to your channel. And I've never done that before, but I'll figure it out. It can't be. Oh, is that? Okay, cool. Oh, perfect. I was going to go try and click the buttons, but there we go. Type slash raid Andy Leonard. Okay, there we go. That's perfect. Because I think we're up to like six or seven people inside here. And then that way I can throw them all over towards your channel. 
Uh, Sudir says, SP Blitz first, as the wait time per core is reporting a negative number. Is it a bug? Yes, but it's a bug in SQL Server. From time to time, SQL Server's SysDMOS wait stats will actually go backwards. SysDMOS wait stats will actually regress to a negative number. Uh, and I, re negative number is a wrong word. Like it's SysDMOS wait stats is always supposed to increase, but from time to time, it'll actually drop and then start going back up again. So it is a bug, but it's a bug in SQL Server. You're welcome to what an interesting name. Uh, it, uh, you're welcome to file that as a bug with Microsoft, but of course it's $500 to report that with Microsoft. Um, Fred says, thanks for answering my migration question. We're tying, trying to automate database deployments. Okay, deployments are not migrations. So just so we got there. Um, there's one DBA and many devs, so nobody set up CI. One guy's job is to sync the databases with Redgate. Is that normal? Yes, that's totally normal. I see that all over the world. Redgate schema compare and data compare being used to sync between a couple of different servers. Totally normal. Uh, uh, ooh, interesting question there uh, from uh, Dimitri. I'll just use that name, Dimitri, because I can't read that because I'm not that smart. I love. I tried to learn Russian when I was in high school. True story. I tried to learn Russian, and I got like two sentences, and that was about as far as I got. I got kind of distracted. But it seems really cool, and it sounds so awesome to hear. Uh, how do I, and, and my, turns out my grandparents or great-grandparents are from like the Ukraine. How do I protect a SQL server from, or server from a DDoS attack that uh, targets SQL server? Don't hook it up to the internet. Chief thing, never, ever, ever, if you can, hook SQL Server directly up to, oh, Canal Pushka. Oh, okay, cool. Um, so ne if you can, don't hook SQL Server up directly to the internet. Instead, put it behind a firewall. Then that way, if your application servers are outside in the DMZ, you let them talk directly to SQL Server, but you don't let the public go talk to it. So that's the easy one. Uh, so uh, a lock, that's the exact same thing that I just uh, answered there. If you listen, maybe instead of typing, you might kind of figure that stuff out. Next up, JS says, uh, I'm a dev who wants to get better at interacting with the database. Oh, very cool. My boss recommends putting everything in stored procedures. What's the best way to test the business logic? Oh, this sucks so bad. So... Testing for SQL Server is a really sad story. There is a framework called T-SQL T, T-S-Q-L-T, that's supposed to let you do unit testing for SQL Server, and somebody in here in chat is going to say that they use it. I don't want to hurt their feelings, but that thing smells like cigarettes and disappointment. It is really hard work. It's really expensive. I'm a fan of unit testing, but it just sucks for SQL Server. It's terrible. Um, so that if you want to do it, you can try using T SQL T. It just absolutely sucks. It's and it's normal to hear people try it to go down that road and then back back out. Um, so in between the two options, if you put your code in stored procedures, it is easier for a database administrator to manage it and secure it and be used repeatedly from lots of different applications, but source control and testability sucks. If you put it inside your application, testability and source control is awesome, but if you get into a performance emergency or you need to reuse that code across multiple platforms, that part sucks. So it's just which one of those two you prefer to take on. Uh, Hungry Hungry Pimple says, what do you think about graph database technologies? If you need it, then it makes sense. But it's also one of those where because social media uh, platforms use it, uh, then all of a sudden whatever Twitter uses, people are like, we need what Twitter uses. We want to be like Google. Whatever Google uses, we're going to use. So I, like often I see people read about these buzzwords and then they try to put them in. So... Uh, let's see here, uh, da, 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 da. I'll delete a couple of ones inside here. So Yogi says, we're seeing a log shipping copy job delay due to big files. Is there a better way to limit the log size during index rebuilds? Yes, take your backups more often. And this is going to sound insane, but you should take, especially if you're running into that problem, I've seen people take their backups every minute. 
That's correct. Re take your backups every single minute. That way you're nibbling off changes instead of waiting a very long time and then trying to tackle a whole bunch. Uh, let's see here next up. Elias says, I'm going from an Access backend to a SQL Server backend, and I'm going to be the DBA. What kinds of things should I be learning? Oh, that's a great question. Um, if you go to brentozar.com and you click on scripts up top, there's a first responder kit that I give away for free. In there, there's a database admin learning plan that teaches you things that you need to do uh, as you uh, start working on databases. So by all means, go give that a shot. The other thing that I would do is say, make sure you can restore. Uh, people get really focused on performance tuning when the really biggest problem that you have to do is make sure that you can restore stuff. That's the most important thing. Uh, Selimowitz says, good morning, Brent. I really appreciate your help. You're welcome. Uh, my question is, how much development do I have to do if my job is a DBA? Oh, I'll show you. So I'm going to search for Brent Ozar, oops, Brent Ozar, uh, SQL Server, DBA, Production, Development. Um, and then in here, I've got a couple of posts explaining what the differences are between the different types of uh, database administrators. So if you search for Brent Ozar, SQL Server, DBA, Production, Development, that will get you to these posts. And in one of these, I have a little chart that explains what the differences are for the different types of database administrators. And now my site's not on. Either that or my internet's down, one of the two. Ah, 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 that's awesome. Well, you know why that probably is? Because there are probably so many of you that are buying things at exactly the same time. You know what? I should go get the cached version because this will probably, no, even the cached version is down. Okay, great. Uh, so anyway, so other folks are saying the same error. So anyway, what you'll do is go search for Brenozar SQL Server DBA Production uh, DBA, and uh, then you can get that job post or that thing right over there. Uh, next up, let's see here. Uh, next up, Francois says, um, maybe because you mentioned retirement with your clarifications noted, are you still passionate about SQL Server data in general? Oh yeah, it's awesome. I love databases. Databases are amazing. It's a phenomenal uh, career. I just absolutely love it. I have a wonderful time with it. I would never want to change my career to something else. It's great. As long as I'm making money, this is the way that I would want to make money. Uh, and then uh, we'll do, there's only a couple more questions in the queue. I'll finish those out until Andy uh, starts streaming there. Um, which one do you prefer using SQL Server Enterprise or MySQL Community version? If you want to make money, this is, no, I'm specifically talking about making money, not spending money. If you want to make money, you want to stand next to the most expensive thing. If you stand next to MySQL, you look really expensive. If you stand next to Oracle, you look inexpensive. So if I'm going to pick which one I'm going to use, I'm going to go for SQL Server. Now, if I'm going to pick which one I'm going to build apps on, that's a little bit different. All right, so Andy Leonard is up in switching or up in twitching. So what we're going to do is segue over to Andy's. I'm going to type this out before I hit enter. So it's slash raid uh, Andy Leonard. Um, now, before I do, I will say thanks a lot for hanging out with me this weekend. I am now going to pass you over to my friend Andy Leonard, who also does SQL Server work. He specializes in data warehouses. So Azure Data Factory, SQL Server Integration Services, BIML scripting, all of that stuff. So you can go watch him. And I hope you all have a wonderful weekend. I'll see you in tomorrow morning. I'll be in tomorrow around morning around the same time uh, doing another morning uh, kind of switch. So I will see y'all then. Adios, folks. Now let's see how this works. So I hit slash raid Andy Leonard, and let's see if this works. I have no idea how this works. Let's go over to my Twitch channel and see what happens. Twitch TV Brent Ozar, and let's see what happens there. And takes 20 seconds or so. Okay, perfect. Uh, he says 20 seconds or so. Do I now have to hit stop on the stream, Surly Dev? Is that how that works? Now, those of y'all who are still on YouTube are still seeing me over here. Uh, but we'll see. 
Uh, and those of you who are on YouTube, you won't be forwarded over. That's only for the people on Twitch. Uh, he says, see the purple bar on the top? I don't, oh, oh, raid now. Oh, okay, perfect. Perfect, there we go. All right, there it goes.